everyone. Thank you for joining us for a Bible study on tonight at the New Beginning Church. We thank and praise God for just allowing us another opportunity just to come out here to worship. Our scripture tonight will come from Ephesians 3 and 20 from the NLT version. It says, Now all glory to God who is able through his mighty power and work within us to accomplish indefinitely more than we might ask or think. We thank God for bringing, bringing us through the hurricane on this week. Some of us had damages, but God knows what we need before we even ask. And God has left us here and he will provide for us and show us what we need to do to get ourselves back together. Our song tonight is I Feel Like Going On. I feel like going Lord, we come now together to lift up your name through your word, 
We pray, Father God, that you speak to us, speak through us. We pray, Father God, that you bless us through your word on today. Bless our lives and bless all that we come up against. Now, Lord, we ask you to encourage those who have been downtrodden. We ask you to lift their spirits even on tonight. Bless us to hear from you, Lord, that we will run and tell men, women, boys, and girls about the goodness of Jesus Christ. It's in Jesus' name we pray and we ask it all. Amen and thank God. tonight, day two, page 35 is where we are, and we will cover one, two, three, and four. Uh, Sister Woodlock, will you do the first part right before one? Brother Woodlock, will you take uh, one? Uh, Sister Brown, will you accept number two? Sister Davis, will you take three and four? Sister Davis, three and four. Sister Brown, number two. Brother Whitlock, number one. And Sister Whitlock, the introduction. We're talking about God's plan versus our plan. Well, last week, we, we talked about the fact that God's plans are different from our plans. When we look at our plans, our plans are self-centered. Our plans are self-centered. Centered. And when we look at God's plan, God's plans are God sent. And therefore, we ought to always look to please God and make sure that our plans align with God's plans. Many times we look at our plans and we expect God to align Himself with our plans. Isn't that right? We want God to get in, get in a hurry aligning himself with our plans. Anybody, can anybody identify to that? Anybody, anywhere? Can you identify to your desire for God to line up with your plans? Because we just want what we want when we want it, right? We just want it the way we want it the while we want it. And we want God to just get in line. We hate to say it. We, say, we hate to admit it. But the fact is, we want God to get in line with our plans, and it's a common thing among us, so we might as well just accept it. Amen. Thank the Lord. We might as well accept the fact that we want God, God, you do this, and a lot of times we want God to be our, our bellhop. What does the bellhop do? What does the bellhop do? What does the bellhop do? He carries your luggage. He carry your luggage. What else does he do? And when you tell him to. He comes and goes when you tell him. And sometimes we don't even tell him. And we want God to come and go. We want God to carry our baggage, carry our luggage, tote our clothes, carry our desires. But Henry Blackaby and others tell us in the book Experiencing God that we ought to make sure that we follow God's plan. And tonight we're going to find out when we follow God's plan, God's plan, number one, is better than our plans. Number two, we are more successful when we follow God's plan. Uh, many people ask the question, well, why God give me common sense if I can't do it my way? Anybody has an answer for that? Why did God give you common sense if you can't do it your way? Because you don't have common sense. Because you don't have common sense? Okay. Anybody else? Common sense should tell you that God's way is the best way. Common sense ought to tell you that God's way is the best way. Did you get your microphone? 
Yeah. I have Okay, so common sense ought to tell you, but you know how many people do not have common sense mm -hmm. that they know God's plan is better than their plan? A whole lot of people. And what they do is they set aside their common sense to say that they can make their own decision without God. Well, God gave me just enough to make this decision on my own. Yes? But the fact of the matter is when we obey God, when we walk with God on a regular basis, then God is able to point us in the right direction. So, Sister Whitlock, before you read that passage, that those paragraphs, Read Exodus chapter 2, verses 11 through 15. Exodus chapter 2, 11 through, through 15. Exodus chapter 2, 11 through 15. Years later, after Moses had grown up, he went out to his own people and observed their forced labor. He saw an Egyptian striking a Hebrew, one of his people. Looking all around and seeing no one, he struck the Egyptian dead and hid him in the sand. The next day he went out and saw two Hebrews fighting. He asked the one in the wrong, Why are you attacking your neighbor? Who made you a commander and judge over us? The man replied. Are you planning to kill me as you killed the Egyptian? Then Moses became afraid and thought, What I did is certainly known. When Pharaoh heard about this, he tried to kill Moses. But Moses fled from Pharaoh and went to live in the land of Midian. Um, I'm out. Who delivered the children of Israel from Egypt? Moses or God? God did. God chose to bring Moses into a relationship with himself so that he, God, could deliver Israel. Did Moses ever try to take matters into his own hands? He did. In Exodus 2, 11 through 15, Moses killed an Egyptian who had struck a Hebrew. What might have happened if Moses had tried to deliver the children of Israel through a human approach? Thousands of his countrymen would have been slain in battle. <clears throat> Moses tried to personally deliver one Israelite, and that cost him 40 years of exile in Midian working as a shepherd and reorienting his life to God-centered living. When God delivered the children of Israel, how many Israelites' lives were lost? None. In the process, God even led the Egyptians to give their Israelites their gold, silver, and clothes. Egypt was plundered. The Egyptian army was destroyed, and the Israelites did not lose a single person. Now, why do we not realize that it is always best to do things God's way? We cause some of the wreck and ruin in our churches because we have a plan. We implement the plan and accomplish what we can do. We ask God to bless our plans, and then we promise to give him the glory when he does it. Yet God is not glorified for making our plans succeed. He receives glory when his will is done. His way. Christ is the head of the body, the church. What a difference it would make if we obey Christ as the head of that body. He would accomplish more in six months where people yielded to him than they could do in 60 years without him. Thank you. Let me make a public confession right now to those of you who are listening, those of you who are in the room. As a pastor, I made some buckethead decisions. As a pastor, <laughs> as a pastor, I made some decisions that I should not have made. As a husband, I made some decisions that I should not have made. As a father, I made some decisions, even made some statements that I should not have made. As a technician, as an engineer, as an instrumentation tech, I made some decisions that could have blown up the whole ship channel. I remember walking out and I was just about to let maintenance cut into a line and I looked again and I didn't have one valve valve out. Enough chlorine would have escaped to wipe out the whole city of Houston and the whole ship channel. A big old 18 inch line would have been under pressure, spewing out clothing. But God sent another guy to take a second look. I had cleared it. I said, hey, I cleared it. I drained the line. I have a vacuum on it. And when they cut into it, nothing is going to cut out, come out. That's what I had in my mind. One more brother walked by and looked at it. He said, man, did you miss a valve? And I looked and I said, I did. 
It would have been a disaster. I would have made history. I would have been on the news. And I would have been dead. Because even in our day-to-day -day relationships, day-to-day -day, uh, activities, we have to stop and listen for God. Don't think you just got to listen for God in spiritual things. You have to listen for God in our day-to-day -day activities, even those activities in which we are smart. I mean, I knew this stuff. I used to walk around as a technician. I would walk around with a hard hat on in the back of the hard hat and said, fix it, comma, I can. What is that saying, Brother Whitlock? It said, fix it, comma, I can. What, 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 what was I really saying? As a technician, what was I? When it came to instrumentation, what was I saying, Brother Whitlock? That you thought you knew what you were doing. That, that said, I thought I knew what I was doing. I, I was an operator and I made a mistake and didn't close a valve. Now I'm a technician and I got the nerve, the audacity, the gall to put on the back of my heart that fix it, I can. From an operation standpoint, I blew it. When I moved to be a technician, I blew it. When I moved to be an engineer, I blew it. Now that I got all that out there, y'all can't criticize me because I confess it. <laughs> now the fingers are pointing at you. Do you really, really remember? Can you remember just one time that you did it your way instead of doing it God's way and you blew it? Whether it's with circumstances, with activities, with relationships. Let me tell you another time. I told you I blew it as a father, right? And this is a, this is a small one. I can't tell you the deep ones. I'll tell you the small one. I got out the car. I listened to the radio. And I got out the car. And my daughter was sitting in the back seat. And I got back in the car. It was a different genre of musical. And I was like, you changed my radio? No, I changed no radio. Daddy, you did change my radio. I wasn't listening to this stuff. You changed my video. Let's say it was on FM 105.7. When I got back in the car, it was on a different station. And man, I just knew for a fact that radio didn't change itself. I knew she changed that radio. And what I did not realize until later, when I got out of the car, I bumped the radio. And it went from FM 105, because you have an FM 1 and you have an FM 2. But when I bumped it, it went to FM 2. I had to apologize. You know what it's like to apologize to your children that won't ever let you live it down? You know what it's like when they can point at you and say, you were wrong. You falsely accused me. And all I had to do is just listen to God. But instead, I'm operating in my own wisdom. Anybody else guilty of that? Since I put it out there, anybody else want to put a little one out there? Just a little one. You don't have to tell the whole, the whole big story. Just a little story. Anybody? Get the mic and just tell us about that one time. I know you never did it but one time. Anybody? Just one time. Well, there's one time. <laughs> uh, long story short, I was in college and a group of friends and I, we decided that, that we were going to go canoeing. Mm -hmm. It had just uh, rained the day before. So when we got there, the guy said, well, everything's pretty flooded, but I might have one of those. So we were at him and we told him, yeah, 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 put us out there. And then that's the day I almost drowned. So, Oh, Instead oh. of listening to the warnings that God put before us, we just ran on ahead and just did our own thing. And mm -hmm. because of that, I almost lost my life. Man, you wouldn't have been a good husband had you. Look what God did for you. <laughs> you wouldn't have been a great teacher. You wouldn't have been a great member. Look what God does. Nothing. And, and, and check this out. 
Even when we make crazy decisions, God yet let us live. Yes, yeah. He spares our lives. Mm -hmm. He knows that sooner or later we're going to come to our senses after we get through bumping our heads. Mm -hmm. The paragraphs that, that was just read, first of all, Exodus chapter 2, we find Moses, Moses who is a Hebrew, finds an Egyptian and a Hebrew discussing some things or fighting. Moses takes the thought of himself, says, what did he do? He did what? What did he do? Struck the, struck the Egyptian. He struck him? And what happened to him? He died. He died. He so, hit him. <laughs> hit him after he died? He hit him after oh, he Oh, he hit him. He hit him. Well, I mean, you know, anybody gonna walk over and say, look, I killed one that's from Pharaoh's uh, Pharaoh's palace. You, did you think he was gonna do that? He killed him and he hid him. What, did Cain, what happened to Cain's neighbor? Cain killed him and he hid him. Guess what? Now what we do, we do crazy stuff, and we try to hide. You ever seen, you ever seen a, a commercial where a child is in the bathroom, and the Joker has peanut butter all in his head, all over his face, all over his clothes. Now he takes the peanut butter from the kitchen, going all the way to the bathroom, now he got it all around his neck, all over his clothes, and his mama asked him, who did that? Who? Not me. It's kind of like Judas asked Jesus, Lord, is it I? And that's that sin nature we have, right? And in the midst of this sin nature that we have, it drives us to do crazy stuff and then try to hide it. Some, some girls, not the girls at the New Beginning Church, but some girls, mama would say or daddy would say, you're not going out dressed like that. So they go back in the room and what they do? What do they do when they, they that mom and dad say you're not going to dress like that? What do they do? Girls, ladies, what do, do y'all do? So Sister Brown, tell us what the other folks do then. Put something over it. Oh, they keep it on? Yeah. And they put something over it? And then what they do? Until they get where they're going, and then they uncover. And in the car, <laughs> when they step out of the car, it's a brand new person. <laughs> so it's weird like you were about to say something. No, I was going to give her the mic. Baby. Oh, I thought you were about to say, yeah, that, I put something over it. <laughs> <laughs> Not I. <laughs> I don't blame you. I wouldn't confess it on, on camera either. <laughs> so, so the bottom line is we make decisions, and we know that God is not in our decision making. We do it anyway, and then we, we hide it. Check out what else we do. After we make that decision, we ask God to join us in the midst of the decision that we've already made. Yes? How many of you had dreams and visions of what you want to be in life, what you're going to do in life, and then you didn't consult God until you got in the middle of it? A lot, of, a lot of engineers have, have decided from a little child that they're going to be engineers. Then when they get in school, they'll be like, what in the world did I get myself into? Why did I choose this? Nurses have decided that they're going to be nurses. Doctors have decided they're going to be doctors. I mean, growing up, you put stuff in children's mind and they have concluded we're going to be a doctor, lawyer, what else, teacher. And then when they know that they have to get in there and dig in, they're like, what in the world have we gotten into? There are children who actually change their majors five times in four years. They can graduate with no particular degree. They just got the hours or the units, and, and they can graduate. They can lose, leave campus and say, I graduated in the class of 24 and have no degree, no plan. But when we do it God's way, when we consult God up front, God is able to lead, guide, direct, and protect us. So here's Moses. He kills a guy. He hides him. 
what was the retribution for him killing the guy and hiding? He took off, right? He ran. There's another video out there of a little baby in a stroller. Little baby in a stroller, he can't even walk. He's in one of those, you know the things that goes around you, you got a cave in front of it, and they, it, they teach a walker, teach the children how to run and walk. And this man said, hey, I want to talk to you about Jesus. That joker takes off in that stroller. The man, <laughs> the man running behind him, he's taking off in that stroller. His legs are moving faster than Chicago Richardson. Richardson. He is moving. And the man said, don't run from Jesus. I need to talk to you about Jesus. That baby may be a year old. And he's running in that stroller. I mean, that stroller is moving. That's how we are when it comes to God. God trying to tell us something. God trying to talk to us about something. And boy, we are getting out of it. And the man clearly said, don't run. I want to talk to you about Jesus. That baby is gone. I mean, he is running. And we may not see that same picture when it comes to us, but that's what we do. We take off when it comes to godliness. We run. Especially if we're Christians, we've been Christians for a little while, and we think we know that Bible. And we're going to do it our way. And because we're going to do it our way, we get ourselves in trouble. Look at Moses. He runs away to Midian, and that one mistake caused him how long? Forty years. He was a fugitive for forty years. A forty-year fugitive. He's running. He's on the run for forty years. Moses, somebody that grew up in the palace. You know what that tells me? that it doesn't matter how we grow up, we can still mess up. You know, they, they say certain neighborhoods are given to drugs. But when it starts hitting other neighborhoods, then everybody's concerned. Yes? I remember in the 80s, there was a beer out called Coors Beer. And in our neighborhood, a lot of people were drinking Coors because it was cheap. But it had, it had a chemical in it that causes your brain to go dead over a period of time. And as long as the brothers were drinking Coors, they were selling Coors. But when everybody else started drinking Coors, they found the dangers and they started slowly taking it off the market. Let me tell you, when you don't do it God's way, God has a way of leading you to yourself. Cause Moses 40 years. Now check this out. Moses meant well, didn't he? Mm -hmm. The problem is Moses didn't stop the fight. Moses took over the fight. He meant well. I'm not going to let you kill a Hebrew. I'm going to take care and protect this Hebrew. But he kills a man and he leaves. It causes him 40 years. 40 years, slain in battle, a human approach. When we take a human approach and ignore God's approach, it will cost us 40 years. 40 years. When we decide we're going to do it God's way without consulting God, and then when we can consult God, we don't move as God would have us to move, it can cost us 40 years. Isn't that something? But when we reorientate our lives to a God-centered life, life is easy. Life becomes easy. Life becomes so easy. When Moses does it his way, the thousand of folk die. But had Moses done it God's way, no one. The Bible says, the Bible talks about the fact that when you do it God's way, nobody is destroyed. None. When God delivered the children of Israel, how many Israelites' lives were lost? None. In the process, 
in, in the process, God even led the Egyptians to give the Israelites gold, to give the Israelites silver, and to give up their clothes. On the way out of Egypt, God touched the hearts of the people, and they gave up their values, valuables to those once slaves. That's why, that's why Grandma would say, it all, it's all about how you look at it. We didn't understand. We didn't understand during the civil rights movement. We didn't understand why our foreparents would walk a certain way. They would carry their hats a certain way. They would, they would bow their heads a certain way. Now I understand they were looking out for the future generation because we didn't have sense enough to do it. Miss Wayne, Miss Wayne came, Miss Wayne King, we call her Kane. Miss Wayne King, Mr. Wayne Kane's wife, would have grandmama clean her house all day, all week, year after year, keep the babies, and then when she brought her home, she couldn't even ride in the front seat. And as little preteens, we were furious because we knew that that was demeaning. They had a grandson, I mean, they had a son, then my dad and the rest of them were, were told that they got to say yes sir, and no sir to a 12-year-old. But my daddy, just wouldn't do it. And if it had not been for his skills, we would no longer be living on a plantation. But because he was skillful, he did some, some stuff that they thought was crazy that he was able to get away with. Tractor stuck out across the field. Man walks out there, Mr. Wayne King, walks out there and said, go out there and get that tractor. He said, you go out there yourself. I ain't going out there in that mud. That's the kind of dad I grew up with. He said, that tractor be there in the morning. I'm not walking out there. And he never allowed anybody to demean him in the presence of his wife and his children. The fact of the matter is, he believed that he was just as important and just, just as valuable as anybody else. And I say to you, you are just as valuable as anybody else. And as you are valuable, you, you increase your value as you obey God and allow him to use you. Let's bear with you. Why do we not realize that it's always best to do things God's way? We cause some of our own wreck and some of our own ruin even in the church. In the church. I told you to start with, I made some buckethead decisions as a pastor. Had to go back and redo it over and over again. Had to go back and apologize. I remember I had a lady and her son stand up in the middle of the church service and I publicly apologized to them in the middle of the church service for something I said the previous week because I made a bonehead statement. Now you're not going to get that at every church because that's a sign of weaknesses to some. But when we do it God's way, God is able to develop you where others will see you not as weak but as strong. Takes a good person to do it, right? But if we mess up in public, we got to deal with it in public, accept it in public, and hold ourselves accountable in public. We implement a plan and accomplish what we can do. We implement that plan. We ask God to bless our plans after we've implemented the plan. Then we promise God, God, this is going to glorify you now. <laughs> God, you're going to get the glory, and God, I'm going to give you the glory when it happens. That's good church talk, isn't it? And that's how we do it. That's how we should do it. We ought to seek to glorify God. And we would even make promises, God, this is going to give you glory, God, God, I'm going to do it where you will receive the glory. And we are here on planet Earth to glorify God. And God ought to get the glory. But look what, look what they say. Christ is, 
Christ is the head of the body. The church. Christ is. Who is? Christ is. What a difference it will make if we obey Christ as the head of the body and yield it to him. Then we, then we will be able to do great things in a matter of seconds and not years. Because when God does it, he's able to do it in seconds. Well, it may take us years to do it. Many places in scripture, the Bible says that Jesus talked to a person or Jesus healed a person. And the next portion of that verse says, immediately they were blessed. Immediately they were healed. The, the Bible talks about the fact that God wants to use us in such a way until everybody sees him and not see us when we do it God's way. I, I remember praying this prayer, Lord, bless me when I get this possession that it will glorify you. Lord, just because I want it, if it's not going to glorify you, shut the door. God, I want it so badly, but Lord, I submit to your will. Shut the door. Lead me somewhere else where it will glorify you. And I thought that was a great prayer. Don't y'all think that's a good prayer? Mm -hmm. yeah. But here at Blackaby says, we need to look where God is already at work. <laughs> what God is already doing. Remember, two lessons ago, we it, it dealt with this pastor that sent these children to the university, to a college to just to see what God is at work. So sometimes we got to go somewhere to see what God is at work. It's not enough to hang around New Beginning. Because there are some places at New Beginning that needs improvement. There are some things that your pastor needs to see happening other places that we can bring that back to New Beginning and see if God will make it happen here. A few weeks ago, I... I went to St. Paul Church in Mississippi, and it was men's day, but the church has been out of their building for two and a half years because they had a fire building. So they were meeting at the Brown Baptist Church, and this Sunday that I went to preach the men's day service, um, it was their second Sunday there. And it was their second Sunday back in their own church out of two and a half years. And I just sit there, and it was an explosive service. These folk were so glad to be back in their building until they carried over from the grand entrance the previous Sunday until they were on fire that Sunday. The men course song, and it was a mind-blowing experience. So when I stood up, I had to stand there for a while while they continued to rejoice. And I joined in with them rejoicing. And then I told the story about Paul Bell Bryant of the University of Alabama. They were playing in a game, and one guy ran the ball past Paul Bell Bryant on the opposing team, straight to the end zone, touchdown. Paul Bell Bryant said, next year, I'm going to get me some of those. So after I told that story, I looked back and I looked, I said, when I, I see the men singing, I see the excitement that's going on with them. I said, I'm going to get me some hours. <laughs> Men were on fire for the Lord. And we had already spent three to four hours together that Saturday. And it carried over to that Sunday. They were on fire for the Lord. And then I was scared to go preach at the Brazilian church that evening, that Sunday evening. But then Brother Walker said to me that we're having a fish fry. And the whole purpose of the fish fry is to meet the guest pastor. So what did I have to do? I had to cancel my Brazilian trip to, to be at the fish fry. And even at the fish fry, as we sit down and, and conversated, that they were on fire for the Lord. I'm going to get me some of those. We got to get us some of those. 
So we have to see where God is at work, see what God is doing. And the interesting thing is, many of the people in that church, including the pastor, grew up in Indianola, Mississippi. So when I stood up behind the lectern, lectern I began to, to tell the people how I appreciate the pastor. And the question is always asked, can anything good come out of Indianola, Mississippi? And I pointed to the pastor and said, yes, there is. It's because we have to see what God is at work, see what God is doing. And when we see what God is doing, we have to join God's ways at work. Number one. And uh, we're going to answer those questions as we go. The following God's ways, number one. Read the following scripture and look for God's response to those who will not follow his ways. And then answer the questions that follow. I am the Lord your God who brought you up from the land of Egypt. Open your mouth wide and I will fill it. But my people did not listen to my voice. Israel did not obey me. So I gave them over to their stubborn hearts to follow their own plans. Psalms 81 verses 10 through 12. Amen. Thank you. Okay, let's do the question. Uh, question A, what had God done for Israel? What had God done for Israel? So it was about reading and then he look around and shout. <laughs> <laughs> like he's to teaching you. tonight. <laughs> Give somebody else a chance to ask that question. Uh, he had brought them out of uh, Egypt. Amen. This is what God did. Uh, question B, what did God promise his people? And it seems here that, uh, I guess you can say food, but I guess I'll say to take care of them. Okay. To fill their mouths. Yeah, yeah fill their mouths. Mm -hmm. Take care of them. Eat. Question C, how did the people respond? They responded with disobedience. And then question D, what did God do? Well, he turned them over to their stubborn hearts so that they can follow their own plans. Amen. Thank you. So, so they responded in a way where they didn't listen to God. They responded in a way that was disobedient to God. Look at D. D says... And God turned them over to their own stubborn hearts. Let's look at the word reprobate. R-E-P-R-O-B-A-T-E. -E. Reprobate. R-E-P-R-O-B-A-T-E. -E. What does the word reprobate mean? And where we've seen that, what have we seen that word before? The word reprobate. What does it mean? Reprobate. R E P R O B A T E, reprobate. What does that word mean? Anybody? God will turn you over to a reprobate man. What does that mean? Well, God takes his hands off you. And okay. God lets you do whatever you want to do. God takes his hands off you. You just continue to do what you want to do. The old saints back home in the country would say, Wrong then. Wrong then. So, Brown, what does that mean? Wrong, just wrong, do whatever you want to do. Sister Wonder Moton said, Sister Wonder Moton Richard says, says that uh, that it's sinful. Reprobate is sinful. Anybody else? First of all, the word reprobate is unprincipled. That word in the Greek means to be unprincipled, meaning you have no principles. You do anything, say anything, act any kind of way. And God just takes his hands off. And it was so dangerous. We were so afraid. Brother Miles, we were so afraid when any senior person, any senior citizen, any seasoned saint said, go on then. If they told us, I'm going to take my hands off of you, it didn't even matter if they were our parents or not. What's her name? Silly? 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 
Now it came across as a funny hex when she said, nothing you do will prosper until you do right by me. From that day on, Danny Glover started going down here. <laughs> From that day forward, Danny Glover would almost crawl to the mailbox. His hair began to gray overnight. His health began to fail. When God takes his hand off you, life is headed downhill. The word reprobate means you are self-controlled. You are controlled by your own self, your own sinful self. The word reprobate means you are wicked. The word reprobate means that you are shameless. I mean, you do stuff and ain't got no shame in your game. And we see it on a regular basis. At the gas station, especially the last two days, three days. <laughs> you try to break in front of somebody at the gas station, and they've been sitting in this line, and the person that does the breaking, they, they ain't even shame about it. And you could be in line to get food at a church and people get into a fight. Matter of fact, the constable was giving away food and people right there, all these police officers out here, all these constables out here, and people still don't mind cussing them out. We, we went on a mission trip and, and my sister had already warned me, I don't know why y'all won't come to Memphis. Memphis is number two in crime. Midnight, most of the people on the, on the bus sleep. We drive into Memphis on Shelby Street. I mean, literally, no, exa no exaggeration, literally 25 police cars with lights on at midnight. And one woman was so disturbed by what had gone on, she's still trying to fight with 20 to 25, 15 police cars, 15 police cars over there where she is. At least one police officer in every car. Another 10 police officers over here. They run across the street in front of the bus to get over there to stop one woman from fighting. How is she going to make it with 25 police officers? Not to mention there are about another 15 police officers across the road with, with the roadblock. No exaggeration. I videotape it. I show it to you. Everybody else was sleep, slowing, and slobbering, but I, I watched it all because if some, bar, some bullets started flying, I knew how to hit the floor. And for me to sit there and watch folks still trying to fight with all these police officers there, they were shameless. They were wicked. They were self-controlled. They were unprivileged. This word reprobate in the Greek means immoral. Immoral. This means to be disapproved. Now let me tell you the bottom line. When God turns you over to a reprobate mind, this is what this word means. Predestined to damnation. Predestined to damnation. There's no hope. We, we look at Judas and he was the ch child of perdition. He was the son of perdition. Judas. He was here for the purpose. He was here to, to make sure that, that Jesus got to Calvary. But he was destined to damnation. He was destined to damnation. We had number two. Let's look at number two. Number two. Number two. Number two. Page 35 and 36. Page 35 and 36. Top of 36. Number two. Now read the next two verses and see what could have been true for Israel. Okay, this is still Psalm 81, and now we're reading Psalm 81, 13 and 14. 
If only my people would listen to me and Israel would follow my ways, I would quickly subdue their enemies and turn my hand against their foes. Psalm 81, 13 through 14. What could have been true if Israel had listened to and followed God? He would have uh, subdued their enemies mm -hmm. and turned uh, his hand against their enemies. Amen. So look at what he says. If Israel, if Fannie Mae, if John, if Jim would just listen to God, if Mary would just follow God's ways, if Jonah would just do what God has asked him to do, he will subdue, subdue, make his enemies submit to him. He will subdue his enemies. And he will turn his hands against his foes. In other words, Yolanda Adams says, the battle is not yours, it is the Lord's. But the only way the battle can be God and God will fight your battle is if you obey God and God will fight your battles. I remember very plainly and clearly I was upset about something and I just happened to be at the church upset. And you know, I thought I was living right so I just knew God was going to take my thing and run with it. And I was upset and I went to the pastor and I said, Pastor Johnson, this is what's going to happen. He said, God ain't going to go around jumping on folk for you. He said, what make you think that God is going to go around jumping on folk for you? But I was ready for that question. Because I'm obedient unto God. Well, to the, most, to the best of our ability, right? But are we really obedient to God until we submit to him, until we listen to him, until we follow his ways? Because, you know, one thing about it, I've learned at a very early age in my Christian walk, I learned that if I submit to God, I listen to God, if I follow God's ways, he will make my enemies my footstool. He will subdue my enemies and his hands will turn against them. It's one thing to subdue them. That means to hold them back, to hinder them, to stop them. But not only will our God hold them back, hinder them, to stop them, to cover us, God himself will turn his hands against them and fight our battles. Look at God. But check this out. There are some things that you have to do. There's a mindset that you have to have. There's a lifestyle you have to contend with and stick with it. I remember driving that long drive from, from Sweeney, Texas, and let's call him Jeff. Jeff had gotten on my nerves for the last time. And Jeff and I were co-workers and, and Every time I did something as a technician, he would go back and undo it and try to make me look bad. That day we were in the shop, I've had enough. I've had enough. I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired. God, I'm sick and tired of turning my cheek. I ain't got the two. I ain't turned both of them. So Jeff and I had these words. And on Friday, I didn't carpool because we had different shifts, so I had to ride that long drive for an hour and a half by myself. I was steaming hot when I got in the car. But when God settled me down, I began to say, Lord, bless Jeff. Bless his household. Bless his finances. Bless his children. Lord, touch his heart. No longer was it about me, it was about God. I didn't even at that time, because God had me in that zone, I didn't even ask God, God, make him my footstool. My focus was on doing what God had asked me to do. And because God is faithful, God will do what God does. 
The Bible says pray for your enemies. He didn't say pray, Lord, kill them. I mean, that's the temptation, right? He says pray for your enemies. And so I found myself praying God's will in his life, praying for his family, praying for his health, praying for his finances, praying for him to advance on the job. Now the focus is no longer on me and my hurt feelings. It's on God. That's what God wants us to do. Now I'm gonna tell you, I ain't had very many moments like that. But God dealt with me that day. And he set me up for the next thing that will strike me. He set me up to be able to handle that one well. We, we went to the beach one day and uh, I was standing in the water and, and I noticed something that was taking place on a regular basis. One wave would come in. It would rock me. Another wave would come in. It would push me. The next wave came in, it pushed me to, I had to take a step to stand. But God spoke to me and said, that's how life is. The smaller things hit you first to prepare you for the next thing. And if you don't handle the small things well, the next thing going to bowl you over. Every wave that came against me was a bigger, higher, harder wave. God was just preparing me for the next one. What is God preparing you for? God spends 40 years preparing Moses to lead these people into the promised land. Then he gets there and don't let him in. But God spent 40 years preparing him in the backwoods of Midian so he would be equipped to lead these people. Theologians believe there was over two million people that he was leading at one time. Number three and four. Number three and four. Who has three and four? <clears throat> Number three. Locate in your Bible and read Hebrews 3, 7 through 19. Why were the children of Israel denied entrance into the promised land? Did you want that read or just give an answer? Yeah, right for it to be read. Yeah, I should have told you to read that before. I'm sorry, my fault. Let me see. Okay, verse number, uh, chapter, Hebrews chapter 3, verses 7 through, what is that, 19? 7 through 19. It says, Therefore, as the Holy Spirit says, Today, if you hear my voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion, in the day of trial in the wilderness, where your fathers tested me, tried me, and saw my works 40 years. Therefore, I was angry with that generation and said, they always go astray in their hearts, and they have not known my ways. So I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. Beware, brethren, lest there be any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. But exhort one another daily while it is called today, lest any of you be hearkened through the deceitfulness of sin. For we have become partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast to the end. While it is said, today if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. Verse number 16, for who haven't heard rebelled? Indeed, it is not all who came out of Egypt led by Moses. Now with them was he angry 40 years. Now with whom was he angry 40 years? Was it not with those who sinned? Those corpses fell in the wilderness, and to whom did he swear that they would not enter his rest, but to those who did not obey? So we see that they could not enter in because of unbelief. Hebrews 7 and 19 in the paragraph. 
Hebrews 7 and 19, 7 through 19, that's what that was, okay? So, the answer was, okay, it says, locate in your Bible and read Hebrews 3, 7 through 19. Why were the children of Israel denied entrance into the promised land? Because they just simply would not obey God. Okay. All right, we adjust our lives to God so we will do, so he will do through us what he wants to accomplish. God is not our servant to adjust his activity to our plans. We are his servants and we adjust our lives to what he is about to do. If we do not submit, God will allow us to follow our own devices. In following them, however, he will never experience, we will never experience what God wants to do on our behalf or through us for others. God brought Israel out of Egypt with many miraculous signs and wonders. Wouldn't you think the Hebrews would trust in every circumstance after that? When they arrived in the promised land, however, they did not trust him to conquer it for them. As a result, they spent the next 40 years wandering in the wilderness. In Psalm 81, God reminded Israel that he would have conquered their enemies quickly if they had only followed his plans rather than trusting in their own strength and wisdom. Okay, let's look at Rouse here number four, if you don't mind. Number four, question, questions, number four. Number four, answer the following questions. In your own words, describe how God works. Answer that question too. Yeah, you may. Okay. <laughs> How God works. God works by accomplishing his purposes in the world in his own time and in his own way. And he invites us, his created beings, to join him in the work that he is already doing. B, why are people satisfied to pursue their own plans when God has so much more for them to experience? Because our own plans are what we desire in our flesh to do. That could be uh, some well-intentioned things, some things of good motive, but it's what we desire to do. And that's more comfortable for us. Amen. It fits better with where we want to go. Because when we follow God's plan, then we have to make adjustments in our lives. Amen. So we lack trust when we follow our own plan. We, we lack that trust. Thank you. We, we lack trust. We, we don't do it God's way. We must get to a point where we adjust our lives to God. So God will do through us what he wants to accomplish. And this next statement, I put an asterisk there. God is not our servant to adjust his activities to our plan. God is not our servant where he should adjust his activities to our plan. Rather, we are God's servants. We are to adjust our activities to what God is about to do through us. God wants to use us. God wants to bless us. God wants to stand for us. God is speaking to us, and God wants us to adjust our plans. There must be an adjustment in order for you to get the best you can be from God. Question or comments? There must be some adjustments. Have you had to make any adjustments when you decide to follow God? Have you had to make just one adjustment? Matter of fact, our adjustments must be continual. 
We can't get upset with God because he's God. He's sovereign. Sovereign means he does what he wants to do. When he wants to do it. Any way he wants to do it. With whom he chooses to do it. He is the sovereign God. Do you know how many babies have been aborted and we still here? Don't you know we could have been miscarriages, but God saw fit to keep us here? Job said, I cursed the day I was born. But yet, God saw fit to bring him here so years later we could read about it. Job said, I cursed the day I was born. I wish I, what he said, I wish I had never put foot, uh, never been born on planet Earth. And then he comes back and says, though he slays me, yet will I trust. Though I go through, I'm going to keep trusting him. Amen. Lost his children, lost houses, lost cattle, lost livestock, lost his wife. The wife came to the conclusion, why don't you just cuss God and die? Job said, though, though he slays me, yet I'm going to keep trusting. Theologians are split when he talk about though he slays me. Theologians, some believe that he's talking about the devil. Others believe he was talking about God. Moses, I mean, Job, Job says it doesn't matter which one you come up with, I'm going to trust in the Lord. We sing that pretty song, I will trust in the Lord until I die. That's a pretty song. It's pretty because when tough things show up, it shows us whether or not, see God already knows, it shows us whether or not we really don't trust him. That's such a pretty song. I mean, we sing it and some people shout to it. I'm going to stay on the battlefield and won't even go on the witnessing field. I'm going to fight for him. I, we sound like Peter, Lord, I'm going to be with you and I'll never leave you. Jesus says before the rooster crows three times, you're going to deny me. So we got to trust him. We got to make adjustments. And the adjustments that we make are not for God. The adjustments that we make is for us. We are the beneficiaries of making adjustments to God's plans. Amen? Jesus had to make the adjustments. When did he do it? Over 2,000 years ago. He made adjustments, and these adjustments that Jesus made benefits us. Jesus left his palace in glory, left the place called heaven to come to planet Earth where he gave his life for people that would not obey. He died on Calvary. He was buried. And he rose from the dead. He made adjustments on every level. The question tonight is will you make those same adjustments? Will you make adjustments to honor God? To obey him? To be instructed by him? Will you honor God? The door of the church is open. For those of you who have never received Jesus as your Savior, you can receive him right here, right now. If you just trust the story that over 2,000 years ago, Jesus died on Calvary. He was buried in a barred tomb. Early that third day morning, he rose from the dead. He rose for your salvation and for mine. If this is you, when you bow your head, repeat this simple prayer after me and invite Jesus into your life. So when you leave planet Earth, you will go to heaven. Just repeat after me these simple words. Say, Lord Jesus, I believe that you are the Son of God. I believe that you died for our sins. I believe that you rose from the dead. 
Now come into my life and make me a new person. Thank you for saving my soul. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. We believe if you honestly pray this prayer, believing that Jesus is the Son of God that died for your sins and rose from the dead, we believe that you're born again, you're saved, and when you leave this place, you're going to heaven. We believe that if you now are on your way to another place that, that God has reserved for you, thank you for attending our service. Thank you for being a part of it. If you want a church home, I recommend the New Beginning Church where Jesus is the center of attention and the main attraction, where Jesus is the captain of the ship. Please come by and visit with us and be a part of our service. We are the New Beginning Church. We're at 4251 Shiremai Road, Houston, Texas. That's 4251 Shiremai Road, Houston, Texas. Shiremai is spelled S-C-H-U-R-M-I-E-R. S-C-H-U-R-M-I-E-R. Shiremai Road, Houston, Texas. 77048 USA. 77048 USA. Please let us know if you, if you attended our service or let us know if you received Jesus Christ as your Savior. We want to rejoice with you and celebrate the conquering kingdom Catholic. It is often time. It's time for us to give to the Lord through tithes, offering, and sacrificial gifts. You can give by way of Zelle. Our Zelle account is lifting.jesus at yahoo.com. Lifting.jesus at yahoo.com. Lifting God Jesus at yahoo.com. If you want to mail in your gift, you can do so by mailing it to P.O. Box 503, Missouri City, Texas, 77459. That is P.O. Box 503, Missouri City, Texas, 77459. P.O. Box 503, Missouri City, Texas, 77459. Thank you again for joining us. Please join us on Sunday morning at 9 a.m. for Sunday school. Join us for church service at 10.30 a.m. every Sunday. And also, thank you for joining us tonight at 7.15. Please come back and be a part of our service. We're studying the Experiencing God book by Henry Blackaby. Thank you so much for being a part of our service. Are there any praise reports or prayer requests? Praise reports. Prayer requests, praise requests, prayer requests. We want to pray and lift up the summer enrichment camp. The summer enrichment camp will entail music as well as robotics. Uh, please uh, pray that the Lord deliver us children that are manable, children that are eager to learn, and children that will receive Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. So lift up the summer enrichment camp. Is it this Sunday that we're coming out to set up? This Sunday, this Sunday at 5 p.m. Please come out and join us as we rearrange this place for the Summer Enrichment Camp, 5.30, uh, 5 o'clock, rather, 5 o'clock p.m. this Sunday evening. Come and, and help us uh, rearrange the place to prepare for the Summer Enrichment Camp. Yes, sir. Uh, pray for those affected by the storm. We want to lift up those who are affected by the storm. Uh, this storm was out of its character. It was out of its character. A lot of people are still without water, food. A lot of people are still without electricity. So we want to lift those people and their families up in prayer. We, we don't want to take it for granted that everybody is doing well. Call and check on somebody. Make sure that they are doing well. And then we will look out uh, to, for them and also look out to help them. Amen. So please, ma'am, please, sir, lift those who are affected by the storm. Amen. Let us stand and be dismissed. <clears throat> Father God in heaven, in the name of Jesus, we come, Lord. Lord, you kept us through storm and rain. You kept us through a lack of electricity. Lord, you kept us through the normal sea of food, water, and shelter. And Lord, no one could do it but you. Lord, you've kept us even in the midst of depression. 
Lord, we pray, Father God, now that you continue to watch over us. Lord, we thank you for what you have done. We thank you for what you're doing right now. We ask you to bless us, Father God, that we will go through whatever you would have us to go through with Christian attitudes. Bless us, Lord, that we will walk with you. Lord, we ask you to deliver food, clothes, shelter, electricity with speediness. We ask you to bless every worker that's working hard to make these things possible. Bless every volunteer, Father God. Bless every prayer warrior, Lord. Bless every person who has become victims. Bless their families, Father. Lord, we ask you to bless them and keep them. Now, Lord, bless us as a church, that the church will move forward to being the church, for standing, Father God, for those who cannot speak for themselves. Bless us, Father God, that we will be the church, the body of Christ on planet Earth that is looking for where you are at work. And Lord, we know in the midst of storms, in the midst of remnants, you're still at work. Lord, bless us to seek you out and see where you at work. And bless us, Lord, to join you where you at work. Lord, we realize that this is a great opportunity to serve you and to serve your people. Now unto him who is able to keep us from falling. Unto him the only wise and only true God. Unto him be power, glory, and dominion. Until we meet again, let us join in by saying, Amen, God bless you. We are uniting the church, strengthening families, supporting schools, and empowering neighborhoods to impact the world as we are reaching souls by lifting Jesus. Jesus said, if I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. John 12 and 32. God bless you and God keep you.